Hi everyone, so thank you for joining our webinar today on coronavirus and the training industry and the return to classroom training. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, we'll be using a Zoom call today as we can see. Um, that means that we'll have the usual Q&A open and the chat message. So any questions you want, feel free to throw them in the Q&A and we'll try and get through as many as we can. We'll be saving some time at the end to go through those too. So do feel free to send through any questions you may have. Today we're joined by three different organisations who operate within the training industry sphere through different sectors and I'll be giving themselves a chance just to introduce themselves in a little while. But just to go through a bit of an agenda as to what we're going to be covering off today. Firstly, the, the guys on the call are going to introduce themselves. We'll be talking through a little bit of the impact they felt on coronavirus. And then we'll be talking through some elements of what we're trying to deal with at the moment. So things such as the psychological impact of dealing with the pandemic and the return to work, talking through the practical tips of returning to classroom training, what considerations there are out there, and what each of these individuals have experienced within their own sectors as well. Finally, we'll be wrapping up with some takeaways, some good pieces of learning, and then our final Q&A. So any questions you've got, do feel free to throw them into the chat. I'll just stop sharing the PowerPoint now, and you can see all four of us in full screen there. So I'll just let the guys introduce themselves. So firstly, I'll just start at the top left in, in order here. So Lynn, would you just like to introduce yourself to today's attendees? I will indeed, thank you, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lynn Howden. I am the Global Head of Academy in Learning for Chrysalis Loyalty. Um, we effectively su um, supply loyalty solutions to the automotive manufacturer, lending and retailer industry. And Peter? Hi, yeah, um, I'm Peter. i uh, operations manager for Fastline Training Services. Uh, we deliver a number of um, training solutions for the rail and construction industry, um, health and safety training predominantly. We also offer, offer apprenticeships, MVQs, a portfolio of e-learning, and we also have an occupational health side of the business. Great, thank you. And finally, Scott. Hi there, uh, my name is Scott Chambers. I'm the CEO and founder of 3GHR. We're a consultancy and development uh, organisation. We work uh, helping organisations uh, improve their leadership and management to achieve through their people. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we are coming up to, I think we're in month three or four of lockdown, depending on when every organization went into lockdown. So I think just to position the changes you've made to your organizations and to your training operations, just want to give a quick overview of how the pandemic has affected um, your organizations, what the impact was, um, and just any changes you made to, to cope through the lockdown period. And I'll just mix up which order people answer these in just to keep it fresh. So Scott, do you want to go first in terms of the impact the lockdown and coronavirus has had on 3GHR? Yeah, you're keeping us on our toes. I think, oh, that's all right. I can relax and listen to the other two. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so as a training development consultancy, we, we typically deliver our programs on site, on client site, so we go to the customer. Uh, obviously, in lockdown mode, that just stopped. Um, so uh, there was no opportunity for us to get face to face with clients um, and to get into a classroom, a workshop, a hotel room or wherever the training was going to be. So we had to pivot fairly quickly. We were lucky. Uh, we've been delivering virtual workshops and um, webinars uh, of various sorts for kind of, I don't know, 12, 12 odd years. Um, uh, and we had a portfolio of, of what we call bite size with the, the kind of espresso uh, workshop. So obviously some clients were able to pivot to that very quickly. Uh, we have then worked with the clients that were willing to, um, to take programs so maybe multi-module typically we deliver two three modules uh, over a period of uh, weeks and months um, to pivot that to become a virtual uh, delivery um, and uh, you know um, that that is a combination not just of workshops like this using zoom or other platforms uh, but also one-to-one -one coaching uh, curated content sometimes using LinkedIn learning or other uh, e-platforms uh, uh, self-managed learning groups um, and um, hopefully one day uh, we'll get everybody that we've trained virtually together in one big party uh, to celebrate that. So we pivoted quite uh, yeah, fundamentally to, to be able to deliver what we do online 
um, and continue to enjoy conversations about the relative effectiveness of online versus face-to-face. And what was the uptake on that? Were, were people willing to convert quickly into a virtual format or, or do you think the resistance kind of changed over the period of weeks that it went on for? It, a really good question. So, and, and wow, what a learning experience for us. So, so the, the, it is very client dependent. Uh, so some clients, um, uh, yeah, so straight away, okay, we want to, we, uh, we're halfway through this program, how are we going to keep it going? Can we go virtual? What can you do? So they were very quick to demand of us that, that capability. Um, other clients were, oh, well, I'm not sure how long this is going to last. We'll just put things on pause and hopefully we'll back to, to normal. Um, and that journey continues. So we've got some clients who had said they weren't going to do anything who are now saying, oh, we've been paused for so long. The business is demanding that we pick this up again. You know, we've got people new into management. We've got new management and leadership challenges in the virtual world. Uh, so we're really uh, keen to start to, to, to re-engage with that. So we're, we're being, being able to support them uh, in terms of doing the virtual workshops. And, and I, I had a theory about sectors, that some sectors, the IT sector, I guess, obviously might be quicker to pivot. But even the, the IT, some of our clients in the IT and technology space have said, mm. no, um, uh, yeah, we, we're going to wait. We, we think face-to-face is more effective, so we're going to wait. Um, the good news is that where we have pivoted and where we have um, started working with uh, organisations, there's a lot of learning about what you have to do differently if you're going to do that. Uh, but where we have been doing things differently, uh, we're confident that we're still having uh, impact uh, and still changing behaviours and still supporting the organisation and driving its behaviour and management behaviour differently. Ongoing journey is the short answer now. Interest, interesting about the technology industry as well. Yeah. That's one thing to note as well, guys. You have to start thinking about what your answer will be to what technology have you used. That's come up in every single webinar so far. That's what everyone wants to know. Um, so over to yourself then, Peter. What was the impact on fast line trade as well? It's a very uh, face-to-face heavy industry. Um, what was the impact from coronavirus and, and what did you do to, to pivot in those few weeks? Yeah, well, clearly like everyone, the impact was pretty, pretty significant and we predominantly do everything face to face um just to the nature of the nature of the beast in which we operate the rail and construction industries we were probably quite late on shutting potentially we didn't shut until the 24th of march um and i think a lot of how our tier one clients would have liked us to stay open um because they would have been categorized as key workers in the rail and freight industry um but it was more safety for everyone else really in our mind it wasn't mission critical um so we made the decision we shut for seven weeks uh, actually closed the doors for seven weeks um and opened up again on the 13th of may um but in that time we was actually was surprisingly very very busy um we have been delivering a, a suite of e-learning courses for a while um we took the opportunity uh to reinvest our marketing budget, changed the way we marketed. So we, we focus very heavily on e-learning. We focus very heavily on our MVQ offer, um, which is we do sort of fast track vocational stuff. So it's e-portfolio based. So guys and girls currently out of work could use the time, obviously while furloughed, they can still train, could use the time to start building up their their evidence portfolios for their MVQs, which they those two took surprisingly took off which is great and you know we've continued the marketing spend so the quick the quick change of tack has worked out well for the long term really um and then we spent a time whilst uh, at home revamping our e-portfolio our e-learning portfolio to be sort of more uh, dynamic and mobile friendly again which has been great we've had excellent feedback and <laughs> the uptake has increased so in terms of using all this new new technology, um, it's actually kind of helped us out. Obviously, our face-to-face element of our business did take a hit. I guess in March we probably run at seventy percent usual sort of uh, KPIs. April was fairly non-existent uh, in comparison. Uh, May around fifty percent, and June now we're we just just doing the numbers this week. It's 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 pretty much 90 95 percent of of what we were doing so in reality we can't complain too much um but what we have found is um 
people's appetite for e-learning is it was bigger than we expected uh, moving to a more dynamic and adaptive and responsive platform in terms that they can do it easily and efficiently on their mobiles and tablets has, has helped massively um, and in fact a, a lot of our tier one companies are, are jumping on the bandwagon because their guys can do it at home they don't have to lose a day out of the classroom or half a day out of the class uh, out of work to go to the classroom so it, it it's kind of staying core on our uh, on our ongoing sort of growth strategy and you know we're going to continue to focus very heavily on it um yeah i think that's uh, and we've been back like i say uh, since middle of may um it's been interesting watching people's behaviors but i think that's a, a section the next section so i won't uh, go into too much detail on that just yet We'll definitely get onto that part as well. Um, just on the to- on the topic there of e-learning and people uh, absorbing that, has there been any impact on any accreditations um, that people need to achieve? Is there any tutor-led impacts for courses? So where a course needs to have a, an assessment or a tutor, um, have you been able to convert those to any virtual? Um, yeah. Plans? Yeah. So we um, we offer construction industry training board courses, CITB, uh, and all. They were they were very quick to allow Zoom based Zoom based training. So they made they put a few uh, caveats alongside. So they restricted course numbers. They would have a um, a QA a quality advisor sort of sitting on the course. They could drop in and out. So I guess they would have a number of courses that they accredit running over the country. And the QAs would drop in and out to make sure you know we were doing what we said we were doing, uh, and then the people were all on there watching and viewing, and which worked which worked really well actually I was pleasantly surprised how well it works and I, and I think because everyone was or the delegates you know everyone knew the situation everyone was far more flexible and adaptive and patient you know the morning when everyone's struggling to get on etc uh, you know, no one was too stressed it's all fairly relaxed so that was good and they used uh, a very simple Microsoft forms for the exam so they split it up uh, a bit like what kind of what we're doing now with the four four mini screens is the assessor would sit there with watching five five delegates do their um do their exam i guess so they didn't have their hopefully have their phones out or their friend over their back telling them the answers uh, and then they just cycled through that and it was it was graded the normal uh, sort of our administration process was exactly the same and it all done virtually it, was, it actually worked surprisingly well i think as far as we know, they're keep it. They're allowing it to continue for the foreseeable, which is you know, which is interesting. Um, this has kind of forced it to go virtual, and it looks like it may stay that way. That's interesting. Interesting. Not many too many technology issues either, apart from what I think is the most used phrase at the moment, which is "Can you hear me?" Yeah, and yeah. You're on mute, which is yeah, yeah. <laughs> usually what happens. Um, so thanks for that, Peter, and, and over to yourself then, last but not least, for the uh, the impact coronavirus has had. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, well, we serve primarily the automotive industry, so um, it's no secret, fairly soon into lockdown, um, all the dealerships shut, so all our clients. So we have a product that we put, uh, that is in dealerships, about a 1,000 dealerships in the UK, uh, but it is a global product. So when the automotive industry closed, as it were, and people were furloughed, um, obviously that had a massive impact on us, not only on the use of our product, uh, which pretty much ceased, particularly in this country, but uh, obviously on the training aspect of it as well. So up until that point, pretty much everything we did was either on a regional um, basis or actually in car dealerships. So that was curtailed quite clearly. Um, So we've spent lockdown really converting everything that we did prior to lockdown to be webinar based and kept engagement obviously with our clients Um, during that period, um, having virtual meetings pretty much like this one um, where we were kind of, you know, how are we gonna do this? How do you want us to do this? and getting it ready for when people started coming back, which was kind of June time, but dealerships primarily are open from July the 1st. So it's been, it was a huge challenge. It was a huge um, upturn for us in, in that respect. 
But I think certainly since we've come back and the dealers have started to come back, obviously we're having to deal with the pent up demand. So July is looking incredibly busy for us, particularly on the training side and particularly with webinars. We don't have an e-learning um, offering. It was something that we were planning to do or to look at, but I think obviously that would have, um, that process will be uh, sped up somewhat and we'll be looking to do that uh, early next year. Thank you for that, Lynn. And so what we're going to go on to now is just to talk about the psychological impact. So when people are returning, whether it's back into an office, uh, whether it's working virtually or returning as a delegate into the classroom, the, the psychological impact of that um, for people during the pandemic and, and having worries about, I suppose, for, for health and, and for safety. So I suppose to, to mix it up again, um, over to yourself, Peter, first of all, um, just to talk through the impact that's had and the, the different rules and regulations that are in place and what impact it's had on people's psychological mindset. Uh, well, well it's only, only as far as I can tell the impact on them psychologically, but it's, it was, it, it was, it's been interesting um, from a managerial standpoint um, to see people's reactions and sort of varying needs whilst they've been working from home. So we we were quite, well, I guess we've been quite fortunate where literally, I think every one of our course, well, every one of our services, SaaS. So we've always had software as a service. Everything we do is in the cloud. Um, it was when we shut, you know, we allowed, um, uh, people just to pick up their their computers, take them home if they needed, or like I did, I just turn my laptop on a laptop at home, and it's it, you know we're operating in the same environment, so it was very easy the transition um, from the office to the home environment in terms of systems and processes and administration was it was, was smooth, really uh, everything was easy you know even our phone systems all void or our headpieces they just took them home they connect they log in. It's like they're in the office. Um, we did the weekly Zoom catch up so everyone could see some familiar faces. Um, and I think the, you know the first bit was was all you know was all new and and you know everyone was getting on with it. I think because it was quite long. I think we had some staff members uh, particularly keen to come back actually, but desperate to get back in into into full time work, get back into training. Um, so we uh, we staggered coming back. So for the first for three weeks, there's only three of us actually in the office um, with a few trainers. Sort of obviously our subcontracted trainers were keen to come back. Uh, um, and then we had some some staff that maybe were a bit more concerned. They had uh, high risk family members that they they lived with that they you know they didn't want to risk coming in, which was fine. So like I say, we staggered it and and we basically played it by ear as to when they wanted to come back. Uh, we furloughed for, a, for for six weeks, I think we claimed for in the end. So everyone was paid, was fully paid whilst working at home. We topped up as well whilst they were furloughed. Um, so we were quite fortunate. And I think Adam, our, light, our colleague to come back, only come back on Monday, this Monday. So whilst been working at, uh, working at home. So I think everyone, I would suggest everyone's glad to be back within reason, as glad as you can be at work. I think everyone's enjoying the, enjoying the human interaction. Um, and I think given it's, it's quite um, it's quite bizarre how normal it is uh, in the centre we are. And, and I, I guess that maybe is um, because of the industry working, you know, the guys we train that work on the railway, they, they haven't stopped. For them, they've just, it's been normal normal work it's normal for them to come to a training center to get upskill get the right tickets to do their job and um so for us it's it really it's, it's sometimes it's quite hard to to enforce some of the rules that are that are needed you know to keep the social distancing to make sure people are not standing over each other's shoulders uh, sanitizing their hands etc etc um so i think we psychologically we were we were okay um i think we were lucky to have the flexibility so like i say to be able to pay people um fully uh, and to allow them to come back as and when they see fit um and i think one of the biggest successes and obviously in high you know we didn't obviously do this for this particular reason it was more a scalability as we grow the business 
um, having all our all our core services online and in the cloud was 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 invaluable. It just made everything so easy. We we shut the doors, like I said, on the afternoon of the 24th of March, and everyone was set up and ready to go at home on the 25th. Easy, back to look like it was it was non-existent, just a different environment. So, like I said, I think we were quite lucky uh, in that. So cloud products such as uh, Access Point. Correct. A shameless plug. Yeah. There, of course. <laughs> um, other, other LMS is available, of course. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so over to yourself, Scott, just to talk through some of the psychological impact on, on COVID, uh, from COVID, should I say, uh, that you've seen uh, with uh, 3G HR. Yeah, so, um, well, I can talk about my own experience with my own company. I can also talk about the experience of, obviously, we talk to an awful lot of managers and leaders and people in organizations and how they're experiencing it. Um, there's there's some good work uh, out of the London Business School. Um, they did a study when, when BT went virtual, whatever it was, 10 years ago. Uh, they commissioned some research to see kind of what works, what doesn't work, and... and uh, it's suddenly become extremely relevant for all of us at this time. So they talked about the kind of three pillars to, to focus on. And the first one is getting the technology right. I think we've just talked about that. And yeah, that's a that's a 101, having the laptop, having the internet, having a headset and so forth. Uh, the second is kind of the rhythm and cadence and organization of work. We were we were chatting just before uh, we came online about uh, whether, whether you start to time keep people every second of the day and make sure that they're online for the eight hours that you pay them for, uh, or whether you start to shift to, to, to manage outcomes, but the kind of the ways of working need to be adjusted to the virtual world. Uh, and then finally, there is the, the uh, and this was the one that London Business School said, if you don't, yeah, those first two are kind of obvious, you have to deal with them. And, uh, but the third one is less obvious, but if you don't deal with it, then this is the one that derails you. Uh, and that is the kind of social and psychological aspect of being remote, yeah. In, in, in both physically and potentially uh, socially remote. Uh, so investing sufficient time uh, with people to, to connect, to, to make the human connection. So things like check-ins, things like, um, I, I've heard so many stories of absurd activities that have gone online, from fancy dress parties, to cocktail parties, to wine tastings, to quizzes, you name it, you know, organizations, yeah, Friday, Friday afternoon, four o'clock, let's all get online. If you're not wearing a hat, you can't, you know, you have to tell us a, a, a joke or sing a song, yeah, all sorts of things, uh, which may seem like a waste of time, uh, but all the evidence is if you don't do that, because that all kind of happens a little bit naturally. You might have a coffee with someone, you go to lunch with different people in the workplace, um, uh, you interact with people socially, um, bump into them, and, yeah, all those things just happen naturally. Um, so in the virtual world, it's not necessarily, well, it's not happening naturally. So you kind of have to create it. Um, the other observations, so team, so team meetings, and yeah, meetings when you're together, uh, making some time to allow people to connect. We, we, we spent some time early on in this process, kind of, yeah, so spending time what we, you know, checking in, just how are you, what's going on for you. We have people who are furloughed, who are joining the team meetings, people who are working flat out because their colleagues were furloughed. So we're under intense pressure to deliver and there was guilt between both parties, or oh, I'm guilty you're working so hard, or oh, I'm guilty that you're not here. Um, so the, just the check-in, and we, we abbreviated that eventually to a, 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 a virtual weather, your internal weather, what's it like today? Um, so is it, is it, uh, uh, is it cloudy? Is it sunny? Uh, are there, is there foggy? Yeah, what, what is it? And that metaphor allowed people to kind of talk about their emotional state quite quickly. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I guess to some extent, the, the change to lockdown was sudden, dramatic and forced. Uh, I think the journey back is the one that's really going to be the challenging one. I think the hard work starts now. Uh, it's really interesting to hear Peter's success, so uh, uh, all credit to him and his team to, to, to get back so, so effectively. Uh, but for lots of people, you know, that phasing of people coming back, who's coming back? Are we all coming back? You know, you know, occupancy in the building, how much, what percentage? You know, so, so, so it's more complicated, it's going to be more gradual. Uh, and therefore, the kind of the psychological impacts of am I missing out? Am I, you know, that, you know, that, there's a whole lot of complexity in that situation, which 
once you've dealt with the physical complexity of getting people back to work, the psychological one is likely to be the thing that we trip over next. And, and personally, I don't hear enough organisations thinking about that closely enough. Uh, they're thinking that everyone thinks it's a return. Yeah, it's not. It's, it, we're not going back to where we were. Yeah, e even yeah, we may never. Um, uh, but certainly, we're going going forward to something different. And thinking about that and, and, and how people feel about that and enabling people to speak about it, those that were furloughed, those that worked through, those that had childcare, those that had elderly uh, people that were shielding that they were looking after. So all those journeys are pretty different. And to arrive, I think everybody's going to arrive back in the same state, ready to rock and roll, um, is, is very naive. Um, so equipping and, and managers to have meaningful conversations with people to create the space for people to share and, and retune in, to re-onboard uh, to the organization uh, is going to be a really critical step for, for many organizations interesting and i think yeah the, the, your point you made about um, not a return to work but what does the next phase look like it's going to be something different and that's probably something we'll touch on which is what are we going to keep from coronavirus and the changes we've made to virtual um so over to yourself and just to talk through a few more of those topics that we've just been discussing Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Scott and Peter have said. But I think the nature of what we do in training is a very physical one. So we're used to bouncing off people, having conversations, meeting up with people, getting in little groups um, and doing what we do. So I think, lock I'm going to be brutally honest, I think lockdown, regardless of who you are, was incredibly hard psychologically. Even if, like me, I'm field-based, so I work from home or worked from home, um, prior to, but I was used to go out to meetings and so on and go out to do training. Um, but I think uh, it's been hard because, as uh, Scott said, sorry, you're, you're not in control of what happened. So to be told that you can't do something is slightly different psychologically than choosing not to do something. And having to adapt to it retrospectively is even harder than in the nature of what we do is planning for something to happen. So, uh, the guilt thing, um, guilty that I'm still working, guilty that my team were furloughed and almost, you know, there's a feeling amongst those, some of those that were furloughed that they'd done something wrong um, because, you know, they weren't working, but they, they were being paid for it. Now, let's be honest, up until lockdown, that was everybody's dream. Can I not just stay at home and get the same money? Uh, but actually, in reality, it has completely the, a diverse effect on the way that you think and the way that you act um, and the way that you view things. So I think... It's been really, really hard for those working, um, having to take um, some of the load of those that had been furloughed. So working flat out all hours you know, of the day and night with nobody really to deliver to in the early stages of lockdown. Um, and almost, I'm sure, a feeling of, of some sort of, you know, well, it's all right for you, you're furloughed, you're being paid and you don't have to do anything. And I'm working all the hours that God sends. So, I think psychologically you had to be incredibly strong during lockdown um, and you know I've been going out once a week once a week for food shopping that's all I've been out and I think now we're easing our way back in and our teams are being unfurloughed there's almost the rediscovery of what it is to go back to work and as Scott said it's not a case of coming back to work nothing will ever be the same again uh, either our workplaces or the way that we think um, or the way that we act or react or deliver training even. Um, everything will be changed. Um, I do think, because it sounds a bit negative, I do think, however, that many, many of those changes will be positive and will be for the better and people will benefit them for them short, medium and long term. Um, but it is a case of, you know, just because the situation is easing, it doesn't mean to say that, you know, anybody can re relax and anybody can think, oh, okay, well, we're back to normal because I don't think that exists anymore, to be fair. Absolutely, I agree with all of that as well. And I think, yeah, the, the, the psychological impact is, has been huge and it's been a very difficult time, I think, for not just the training industry, but I think for, for every industry. Absolutely. Just before we go into the return to classroom training and considerations, I'm just going to take a few of the questions that have been pertinent to the, the first half of this, this panel discussion today. Um, so going back to, I think, to, to what Scott was mentioning with the, the virtual classroom and, and people taking it up, um, the virtual training rather than face-to-face, -face, was there anything you did to persuade customers um, to go virtual 
um, but some people just said we want to postpone and wait for face to face to come through. Was there any any techniques, anything you you learned from from trying to persuade people that virtual learning is just as effective as as classroom based learning? Uh, yeah, it's um, yes. Yeah, so there's there's two two people in, in my business we have to persuade. There's the the buyer, which is typically an HR or an L and D professional. Then there's the consumer, um, and interestingly. Our experience is that the buyer is more reticent than the consumer. Um, I, I noticed a question about engaging delegates, which I'm happy to talk about as well. But, but yeah, so so what we've been doing uh, where, where we have uh, struggled is a we've got case studies we can refer people to. Well, look, we've done it with X. Why don't you talk to X? Um, we are not hiding the fact that that we have learned through this process. So we didn't get it right the first day we started with the first virtual uh, program, uh, but and, and you know I'm, I'm happy to share the learnings that we had. Um, so so kind of a, a, an honest and transparent view of kind of how the journey we've been on and how we've arrived at where we are now. Um, and also, if I'm entirely honest, you know, we do. Do, do you want to try one? You know, let's, let's let's try a virtual. Yeah, you know, I, I think I said at the beginning we we had a we've got a range of about thirty titles that we were already running virtually, so we know they work. So you know, have a go either at a discounted price or um, uh, a, a try before buy kind of principle. Um, uh, and that yeah, you know, we had one client particularly I, I remember was you know we'll never do it. It's not in our culture. It was actually a secure a European uh, wide security firm so they had all sorts of technical issues with it as well um uh, and i and i went for that well do you want to have a go you know just come along you know see yeah if you can find 10 people consumers who want to do it um uh, and see and if, if they don't get like it they don't get value from it uh, then, then then we'll agree uh, it's not worth it they did it they loved it they got a real impact they actually chose some quite senior people so that was really good so internally the, the message got transmitted by them that this was a good thing and they've started working on the virtual uh, side that way um, and then uh, yeah, another example i can think of is is a, is a, a one of the technology companies I referenced that was was laggard, laggardly um, kind of didn't want to do it uh, we pointed at a, a company in a similar sector and said well do you want to talk to her? Because you know, yeah, they've done it, um, and, and they're loving it. So really, it, it, maybe it's a competitive thing. Maybe it's a benchmarking. Thing, I don't know, but that seemed to unlock uh, uh, the thinking for for that particular organisation. And then another question as well, which I think has come up on most webinars so far as well. So a question for all of you, which is virtual courses or courses that were face to face and are now virtual. Do you charge more or less for them? It's an age old question we've had from from all the webinars. So Lynn, I'll throw it over to yourself first of all. Um, charge more or less. This happens in every webinar and it's always it, a hot topic. I was like many webinars uh, over the last three months and you're absolutely correct. It comes up every single time. OK, he, here's my thinking. Um, when developing assets for a webinar that may have previously been a classroom course, it actually is a lot harder because you have to um, manufacture in, if you like, the social engagement aspect of it that you would get from face to face training. So it actually takes longer to develop something for a one hour webinar than it does for a full day in a classroom or in for a regional setting. So my personal opinion on that is if it's the same, it's the same person, it's the same content, um, absolutely the same in terms of, of charge. Yeah. It's a, yeah, we <laughs> completely agree. We didn't, we didn't distinguish. Um, it, it's surprisingly difficult to, to build uh, a very good e-learning or virtual package. So yeah, we, we exactly the same price structure and and there's also the it's easier to, for, for the companies to digest I you know a few people did ask was it was it not be cheaper and you know a firm no and it, it was acceptable they know they want the train they know they like it they know the products we deliver or any other firm delivers is good and they just go with it absolutely Scott uh, yeah, so the answer, the simple answer is yes, do we charge more or less? Yes, we charge more or less. We, we don't charge the same. Uh, so, uh, and, and I completely agree with uh, Linda and Peter. Yeah, you, we're, they're buy, yeah, you're buying outcomes. Um, if we are confident we can deliver the same outcome with a different methodology, why would it, why would it be less valuable to you? No. Um, it does cost less because there's no travel time. 
Yeah, there's no overhead cost of classrooms, whether they're uh, in-house or uh, hotels or whatever, um, uh, and there's no you know, overnight accommodation and, and, and such. So, so actually, it is cheaper to the organisation, um, uh, but uh, that's because they're not wasting money on peripheral costs. They're actually only playing for the value that they're getting. So on to our second part of this panel discussion then. So on the return to classroom training and considerations. So for a safe return to the classroom training, what considerations need to be made? Uh, what are people doing to plan and prepare and to make delegates feel, um, I suppose, safe and to keep colleagues and staff members safe as well during this time? So I think purely on the basis that you've been back up and running since uh, 13th of May, Peter, I think uh, we'll, we'll throw it over to yourself in terms of what changes and adjustments you made at Fastline. Um, for the, the safe return of, of classroom training. Um, and one question as well in terms of practical activities that people have to do within a classroom environment, how have we catered for them um, with COVID-19 in, in mind as well? Yeah, so uh, again, we've been very fortunate here. Yeah, we're based in the Centre for Engineering and Manufacturing Excellence. So it's a pre, it's a purpose-built learning campus. So we're very fortunate. They've got, um, we obviously lease the space and they've gone about, like I must say, over above and beyond in the terms that we've got one-way systems, we've got sanitizers at every key touch point, we've got increased cleaning rotors, uh, we've got big set, big sheets up in walkways where you may not necessarily be two metres apart. Um, so it's it, from our external environment of where the delegates come in and how they interact with the centre, it's, it's fantastic. So all those practical things, which I guess everyone's starting to get their head around, you see it in Tesco's and Sainsbury's or wherever you go shopping, um, will need to be in place. Um, in the classroom, again, we were discussing previously that we're very fortunate again in the fact that we've got very big classrooms. They can generally sit 20 uh, comfortably in a normal under normal circumstances. Um, so we obviously restricted our class numbers. We, we took eight uh, so we could uh, satisfy ourselves that they were they are two metres apart. We're actually, I had a meeting yesterday with the, the centre here and we're actually going to, the centre are keeping to the two metres and we are 95% sure we're going to follow suit. So even, if, even with this lower one metre, we're probably going to keep to two metres. Um, in terms of practical elements, you know, I don't actually do the training, thankfully, but uh, I know they are removed, basically, and our, our trainers build around that, and they do different exercises. We do quite a lot of practicals, uh, so we've got practical areas where we, um, they go down in smaller groups, so they would set them uh, a workbook or a task to do in the classroom with one group, and then we, the trainer would go down with another group and do the practical session and then flip them. So it's a bit of juggling around of, of, of normal delivery and breaking it up the way we do it. Um, so it hasn't been too impactful. And I think I, I alluded to it earlier. I think our biggest challenge, you know, because people can be creative and, and smart and trainers generally know, they've been, you know, all our trainers are experienced. They've been doing it long enough and they know where to, they can cut corners or add bits in or, or make it a, um, change the delivery around so it doesn't affect flow or delivery so we kind of trust them to do a good job with that I thought the biggest challenge we found like I alluded to earlier is behavior behavior of the delegates if you are coming back into a classroom it is the biggest challenge you can put we have got signs everywhere we have got strips down the middle of walkways to, to sort of separate and make sure there's a, a, only a one-way flow oblivious to most people oblivious to most people or people can play some people are late uh, lazy rushing people are rushing they don't pay attention to the signs it's it's incredible I, I'm, it's gobsmacked um which is it's our biggest challenge it's the constant reminder constant reminder and where we're in a big a big center you know we have a responsibility to the other businesses here it's not just our own private center but we take the uh, you know the risk yeah, we you know we've we've got other employees from other companies all around us, and you, you know you have to consider your neighbours. Um, whether our delegates care about it or not is is irrelevant. Um, so it's about drilling that home and actually being quite strict. Um, you know you cannot all go to the kitchen at once and stand out and chat, or 
you cannot all stand at each other or eating lunch together or you know separ please please separate or please don't just congregate in one area right next to the exit of another business so their staff can't come out safely um so it's about being mindful and informing our sort of trainers to be mindful and and do crowd slash child control <laughs> So, yeah, and I think a lot of that is instinct as well and habits. Yeah. You know, if you bump yeah. into someone, you know your instinct is to shake hands, or and as soon as you fall back into a classroom environment, then people will slowly revert to what they've been doing for for years. And I suppose that the psychological impact and trying to enforce rules is, is is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we there's a fair amount of our delegates that we see on a regular basis. We we work with a lot of companies regularly and. and and their guys and they're, they're kind of friends and they know each other and it's a relaxed atmosphere and, and people just slip back into the old comfortable ways and it's like no no we need to be careful that you know we have a duty of care to each other and those around us you make any there's a question just come through here and i think it's quite pertinent at the moment did you make any changes to terms and conditions and and i suppose legality considerations for people coming back into the environment in terms of any increased risk or was there any consideration with that? Uh, not necessarily in um, in the terms and conditions directly. Um, we we did do a big communication piece, and I think I linked to our video. I don't know if you're going to going to share that. So quite early on, we were planning for reopening because we knew we would open up quite early, just given the nature of some of our customers asking and requiring us to. Um, so we were quite heavy on the risk assessments on procedures and protocols uh, and then obviously done the video just was a more visual representation of, of the things we were doing to make uh, our clients feel comfortable but i guess our regulators were quite strict on the, on the risk assessments so they were done very early on um uh, so they they are in place and they are communicated out and they are in every one of our classrooms etc etc whether people read them or take notice is a different kettle of fish but there there were we we done them very early on and so but not not to the t's and c's per se but all our we, you know new additions to our quality management system would certainly made and certainly made very early on so, and then over to yourself lynn in terms of the return to to classroom training any considerations and, and the, the the adjustments you've made to reopen the classroom safely yeah, absolutely. So uh, as we said during lockdown, you know, we've, we've kind of gone webinar crazy. Um, and with the return to work, we've, we've, we've now given our clients the option of both. So, well, we do physical training in a dealership, car dealership, uh, as well as regionals um, and webinars. So we, we've given our clients the options and it's quite unusual, but, you know, one client has gone, yeah, let's keep it webinar for a while, probably till the beginning of next year, quarter one maybe, where the other has gone, yeah, but I don't want to lose the physical aspect of what we do. So we're going to have to kind of slim down the course numbers, as Peter was saying, you know, just six to eight to a class, adhere to social dist distancing, etc. cetera. Um, our challenge is that we use venues. So we try and steer away, away from hotel venues um, and have been mindful of that for probably about a year now. So we try and use alternative venues like, you know, um, race car stadiums and football grounds and that sort of thing, just to give the delegates a little bit more interest when they come on a training course to say you can also have fun whilst you're learning uh, with the environments that we provide for you. But going forward, I think the webinar piece will increase, um, but it will always be there as an option to any of our clients that want training. Um, and also the classroom piece i don't think you can do away with because as human beings we are quite social beings and i absolutely understand the challenge that peter's had about social distancing you know when people return to work and um, and therein lies the reason probably i've only been out once a week for the last three months to tesco's because i'm by nature of me i'm a hugger so if i see anybody i know uh, i just launch him with a hug and i'm so scared and it feels to me so rude when you go shopping and you do see somebody, you know, to kind of go, oh, sorry, and, and walk around them like, you know, like there's something wrong with them. So um, I've had to control myself that way. And that's why I think, as I said earlier on, we find lockdown hard. But I certainly know as we get back, I really do hope we get back into face-to-face -face training 
and visiting the dealerships, which have got their own social measures uh, in place and their own new processes to cope with um, you know, the, the social distancing measures. But I really hope we get back into that because I think there's a lot to be said for social interaction, not only for training benefit, but certainly mental well-being benefit as well. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what kind of measure, measures have they put in place at the dealerships to, to ensure that the safety is being followed and that everything is secure to, to be reopening? OK, so um, in terms of the sales departments, you know, desks have been spaced out so that customers can comfortably sit two metres apart and they can also comfortably sit two metres from a salesperson, for example. They're limiting the amount of, everything's pretty much by appointment. Um, so they're limiting the amount of people that come into the showrooms by appointment. They're also engaging more with selling cars. Selling cars online is, you know, is, is gone crazy since lockdown started. Um, they're still offering that service, but also, you know, rather than a face-to-face -face meeting with the salesperson, you can now have a Zoom call with the salesperson um, or with the transaction manager if you need to arrange finance, et cetera. So, um, they're very, very good, and the brands and the, the manufacturers and the, you know the finance houses all help the dealerships with that, with guidelines and you know what's acceptable. And I think they've worked very, very hard. So many dealers came back in June and have spent the month of June putting those measures in place to make sure that customers have the confidence really to come back to a showroom environment um, and and do the social interaction again. Because like me. Many people still want to buy from people. They don't want to buy from a website. Yeah, I think there'll always be a, a people aspect to it, like I said, a social aspect to, to what sure. people wanting to train. Um, and over to yourself, Scott, is there any plans at the moment to, to reopen the face-to-face -face training or is it virtual for the foreseeable still? I'm glad you modified your question for me. So you know, what have we done to go back to the classroom? Well, we, we haven't gone back to the classroom. So, uh, um, and yes, I'm not sure uh, I, I saw, I think it was uh, Joe Nixon asked, uh, you know, will, will it go back? I, I don't know. Um, so I think there's a lot of considerations about going back to face to face. I agree with uh, Lynn in her last comment in terms of, you know, we are at our root, you know, pack animals. We, you know, we're social animals. Uh, we like to interact with each other. So I think that I think we will exactly when and how long. I don't know. Um, I think Lynn's description is a really accurate one in terms of you kind of that you go wherever the client is prepared to go you go you know so they're starting to bring people together into groups and meetings and you know two meters apart customer meetings then that's a legitimate uh, way to conduct training um i think so my expectation at the moment is that we will stay virtual for some time uh we continue to learn about how to do that and again I, I, I'm just glancing at some of the questions. I know you're going to, to come to the map, but some of the practicalities of that emerge as you do more of it in terms of the time of day, the nature of the uh, uh, the work that the trainers can do. Um, I also increasingly reminded um, of the difference between education and training, um, and how education can be done virtually relatively simply. And indeed, you know, as younger generations come into the workplace, that's a very natural learning place um, uh, for people. Um, whereas training, um, again, I think so, uh, was it uh, Robbie Spencer has kind of pointed out the practical skills piece. When you're actually training someone how to do something, there's a physical element to it. Um, then doing that virtually becomes really, really hard. In my business, leadership and management um, uh, practices, because a lot of leadership and management practices are now virtual, you know, done through through the, 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 the same mechanism we're using here today, then actually training people this way to do leadership management this way makes sense. So it's a practical skill to be able to engage someone in a kind of intimate motivation, uh, understanding kind of what really you know, drives them. Uh, to be able to do that remotely is another set of skills on top of being able to do it at all. So it's a, it's a legitimate context to do the training in. Yes, and the, the final piece here, just before we move on to the q and I'm conscious we've got 10 minutes left. Just touching on Robbie's point there about the delivery of practical skills being one of the biggest barriers for return to face-to-face -to -face training. Peter, is there any, anything you've encountered with that? Have you had to reduce any um, practical skills? Is there anything you can't physically continue with during this period due to the social distancing or, or risking any spread there? Is there? Have you had to make any cutbacks in terms of what 
training and practical skills you do and convert them at all? Uh, again, well, yes, is a short answer. There are a couple of specific courses that, that in our, you know, maybe we've not been smart enough to come up with a creative idea to get around it, but we can't practically deliver it because you know they they, they include say very significant manual handling lifts, man, actually manual with no um, no aids. So you, you can't do it. You need you need six guys or six people to lift it. You can't stand a meter. You can't stand two meters apart, or even a meter, in fact. So you know, we just don't deliver those courses, and we haven't done. Um, and we haven't actually got any scheduled just because of that. Um, other, like I said earlier, other ones where there are practical, we swap it around. We go down in smaller groups, um, and we leave uh, we leave the delegates up in the room to to, to maybe do some scenario based stuff, uh, pose them some challenges, do some workbooks individually. Or you maybe do some do some revision um, for tests, uh, and I think the benefit of it is because it's you know because of the call we're doing this for a reason. Everyone understands the reason. The delegates are very very flexible and understanding. So actually, maybe if it drags a day out a little bit longer, or they maybe have a little bit more downtime than would would be normally acceptable. Um, everyone seems to be. To be okay with it, and I said we're at the end of our Q2. We're just just looking at our feedback over the quarter, sort of analysing it. And it. Again, it's all it's all very positive, and, it, and people don't mind, and they're glad to be back in the classroom. So it's actually it's possible you just to be a bit creative. Uh, and like I said, there's a cut. There's two particular courses we're not running because we haven't been that creative to get around it yet. There's no way of doing it. Um, and like I said, just drag it out. We've got disinfectant everywhere so we do some small plant training where guys have to use particular particularly pieces of equipment so one guy or girl does it it then gets disinfected the next person does it so it's it's laborious and tedious but it needs to be done and then everyone's you know everyone understands it um we've got we go through boxes and boxes and boxes of latex gloves so we you know our, unfortunately our uh, environmental status is not the best at the minute but at the minute we can't see any way around it um so it's, it's just being mindful again uh, and making sure people don't slip into bad habits so, and we'll just round off now with a few of the questions that have come through <clears throat> so you guys also have access to q and a's if you spot anything in there you want to take do feel free to, to shout out um so just one here again from from robbie in terms of the online training um, participation levels, delegates being able to hide um, can make it a bit trickier. Firstly, we did actually ran a session with um, one of our friends at London School Online with Andy Johnson um, that covered some tips and tricks for running online delivery. But I suppose kick off with Lynn, um, any, any examples of that where delegates have hidden a little bit, any feedback from trainers about not having that same level of engagement on virtual, virtual training? That's a really, really good question, actually. So, um... I was mindful of that because you're right with webinars, you can have a hundred, 200, 300 people on them. So what we've agreed with our clients is smaller numbers on webinars. Um, and certainly with the managerial level webinars that we do, they're very, very interactive. So we're forever asking them questions, uh, opening polls, gaining their feedback. So actually they have to be on their toes because they don't know when they're going to be asked a question. They're a bit like this webinar today, Matt, really. Um, so that really is just to keep the numbers small and keep it personal and keep it interactive because, you know, people don't want to be one of many um, that can hide in a lot of cases. They want to think that they are the only delegate on your course. So the way to do that is to make sure that the, the numbers are manageable so that you're able to do that. Absolutely. And Scott, yourself, have you had much experience in that, trying to keep delegates engaged? Any tips and tricks for people? Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's a really important question. And again, I mentioned earlier that we we learned. Um, I think the, the, one of our learnings was to it is it, and it's not a legal contract. It was I know we talked about that earlier, but it's a, a contracting with the learners uh, in terms of this is going to be harder work for you because you're not going to be in a room with other people. You know, you are going to have to concentrate. You will get distracted by something uh, over in the left hand corner. So so there's an explicit sharing of that requirement, and th that it will be a different experience for them. 
Uh, so, so alerting people that because we did have pushback early on and said, "Oh no, I wasn't able to concentrate." Oh, and it, um, uh, and it was really difficult to, to to learn in the environment I was sitting in. I said, "Well, okay, so I'm trying to." Sorry about any background noise you may be getting from from my end, just to demonstrate the point I'm making. <laughs> I think the uh, child needs a biscuit, Scott, perhaps. It's, uh, yeah, or two. It's, it's, <laughs> hopefully the, uh, his mother is dealing with it. Um, so, there's, so there's the contracting up front. I think if you can have cameras on, if it's a small enough group so you can do it, that helps if people, you know, the, the hiding behind the cameras um, uh, can do. Um, short sessions. So don't, you know, just work in, in short blocks. Uh, so an hour, an hour and a half max. Give people breaks, even if they're short breaks, um, uh, and tell people that's what they're going to going to be doing, so that that allows them to. You know, we can all concentrate for an hour. We might not be able to concentrate for an hour and a half or two or half a day. Uh, picking your times of days, you know, kind of. Uh, I saw a question to this. Yeah, we find mornings just work better. Um, uh, and then breakout rooms using. Yeah, you know, it's one of the things I like about Zoom is the is the flexibility for breakout rooms. Um, uh, to get people into subgroups, get people talking, making it interactive, at least within the, uh, the data group. Just a few thoughts. Um, and in terms of the, the virtual sessions, um, do you convert them like for like? So is there a one day session delivered in a one day environment online and virtually? Um, or do you break this down again? This has come up quite a few times in our webinars, but what have you guys done to, to convert an eight hour on face to face course into a, into a webinar? Who do you want to go first, Matt? Uh, well, you spoke first, so you can go first. <laughs> oh, um, okay. That's that's a, uh, it is a good question. It does come up a lot, and absolutely, I think the answer to that would be no. To ask somebody sit to sit through an eight-hour webinar um, is torturous. So, as an example, what we did with one of our regional courses is we've broken it into three one-hour sessions. But what we've been able, and that, that's over a week. So, you know, hour on a Monday, hour on a Wednesday, hour on a Friday. And at the end of the Monday and the Wednesday session, what, the practical elements that Peter was talking about earlier on that you can't physically do face to face and watch over somebody, we give them as homework, but with, you know, with, with good um, instructions. I'm not saying regimented instructions, but, you know, this is what we need you to find out from the system. Bring it back with you on Wednesday because that is how we're going to open the course so we get them more involved looking to get them more involved with the actual content of the course as well as you know them just sitting there listening and learning um, and being educated about the system or the process or whatever it is we're currently delivering and just conscious of time here as well one of the practical questions that's come up a couple of times from people there is whether you've considered using shields and masks um, in running face-to-face -face training so a question for Peter there uh, yes. Um, so in, like I said, in our classrooms are quite big, so, uh, it's not so much of a problem. We do have masks available for all our delegates if they choose to wear it. Um, one of our trainers has his own one. He wears it. It's, it's his choice. So we haven't mandated it, but the options are there for everyone. But in our classrooms, there is a lot of space. So we're quite fortunate in that. Whereas in our, in the occupational health side of the business, that is full on PPE, we have a mask and a face shield and gloves, and we require the uh, the patient or the candidate to wear a, uh, a mask because you're more confined. So there's things like taking blood pressure, um, et cetera, they're taking height and weight. You, you are much closer. It's high. Again, it's practically impossible to do the job correctly, which we have to do for safety critical work. Can't get around it, so you have to then provide the PPE. So in that sense, yeah, we, we have done that. And again, other than it being a bit weird the first time for our sort of uh, a nurse and technicians to to wear, not so much our nurse, but in our setting, it's, it's unusual to come into our uh, business and wear it. Um, everyone's been pretty, pretty receptive. So it's, you know, it's understandable. The people coming in for the, for the medicals haven't batted an eyelid, really. It's a requirement. They do it for, you know, it's, it's done. Um, so. okay. And just to finish off with then the, the final point, just a quick fire one for, for all you guys. Um, either firstly, what would be one piece of advice for those considering a return to the classroom environment? And or you can answer 
what do you think will be the long-term impact of the training industry? What do you think will keep? So you can either answer one of those questions. Uh, what do you think, what's one tip for people thinking of returning to the classroom environment, the precautions, or what do you think the long lasting impact will be from coronavirus on the training industry? Um, we'll start off with Scott. Scott, you can go first. On this one. Thank goodness you didn't come to me three seconds ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think it will change. I think it's a knockout of complacency. I think it will evolve beyond this binary discussion uh, of virtual or face-to-face. -face. Um, certainly our experiences, we're using a whole range of learning methodologies uh, from one-to-ones uh, to self-managed learning group to curated content. Uh, and actually I'm finding it very exciting and very stimulating to discover new ways of, of, of doing what we're doing. So I think, it's, I think ultimately it'll be good news. It's just painful right now. And Lynn? either long-term impact or what, what one tip for people considering a face-to-face -face return? Um, okay, I'm gonna answer both, but one's only one, one uh, word. So, you know, on the return, just be sensible and do what Peter tells you to do when you go to his place of training. Uh, the longer-term impact, I think is a positive one because I think as trainers and as, as educators, we have grown and we have learned um, and now we are imparting that knowledge and, and putting that wisdom into our training. So I think long term, it's helped us expand our offerings, um, you know, and prepare for the unknown, to be perfectly fair. So I think it's a good thing. And I think that we should all benefit from it. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Peter. Yep, uh, I'll, I'll do both. So on the future, I think I, I agree with both. It's positive. I, I think it's going to drive us into to using new technologies, new ways of learning, new ways of teaching. So I think it's going to be positive. In terms of just being mindful of people's behavior, you can have the best systems in place, you can have all the PPE, it's people's behavior. So just factor that into your plans about coming back face to face. Because maybe not everyone thinks in the same way as you do, or, or, or genuinely people just revert to normality or you know back to their natural habits uh, and sometimes that's not aligned to what what we require at the minute so just be mindful of that when you're building your your systems and protection and whatever you're putting in place it's our biggest learning that's a great advice Okay, so that's, we've just run over a little bit today, but thank you very much to Lynn, to Peter and to Scott for giving up the time today and just to talk through some of their learnings and some of their tips and tricks for um, dealing with coronavirus and the training industry and also returning to the classroom in a safe environment. We'll be sharing the recording to everyone who's attended uh, for today's session. We'll also be sharing some content from, from each of these three providers as well. Um, so contact details, you'll be able to find them if you wish to, to discuss further. Um, and Scott had a great video as well, which was kind of highlighted in the, the safety measures as well so we'll be sharing that afterwards which is great food for thought as well and um, so we'll be sharing all of that content i'll also reference the um the, the change to a virtual environment taking your courses online which we ran with um, london school online our friend andy johnson there which has some great advice in there particularly for trainers as well so i'll be sharing that too but thank you very much again to our panelists thank you for everyone as well who attended the webinar and for your engagement in the, the q a it's always appreciated and i hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day and um hopefully we'll speak to you all soon Thank you very much.